So it's kind of built a whole marketing growth engine within the, the business model, if you will. Clients such as McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Costa Coffee, Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. How did this happen? Usually the minimal viable product that you have in mind is way more that you need to have. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Marketing on Mars. Today, we have Idan Meir. He is uh, the founder of a company called Right Here. Basically, it's uh, helping uh, people that are blind or visually impaired acquire better better orientation using sound. Um, uh, they're, they're across 2,000 locations currently, uh, are already revenue generating, um, doing some pretty cool things. Major supporters uh, across the world, including a big fan, Stevie Wonder, checked out their, their product. Super <laughs> duper cool. We're going to dive into it. We're going to hear about what makes right here such a good product and also how Edan and his team marketed the product. We're going to dive into it all. So Edan, thank you for, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Simon. Yeah. So first off, tell us a little bit about your story. Like you've 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 co-founded a company before. You've done a lot of other cool things as well. Tell us about your story. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, it's kind of funny when I started working on my different projects at the time, I was calling them projects, not even ventures, although they all had some sort of a business model. Uh, yeah. I didn't understand that I'm an entrepreneur. I was just, you know, working on this project and I have other projects. And, <laughs> and then time goes, uh, I realized that I am an entrepreneur and I always find myself building a new thing, building a new uh, initiative or venture. Um, yeah, in the past, uh, before right here, I've, uh, the last venture I had is, a uh, it's called Habanana. It was a, a hub for startups in my city, uh, in Israel. Uh, I'm now in the okay. U S uh, and in the past five years, I'm uh, all about uh, right here, which I guess I'm going to talk more uh, in details later. Okay, cool. So right here, you guys are, have grown, uh, over 2000 different locations are actually using right here. Right. First of all. Tell us a little bit about the story. How did you? How did it all start? Like, what what made you passionate about this space? Right. So uh, uh, I, the story of my life is that I'm getting lost. Uh, wherever I go, I, go, I get lost very easily. Uh, and when right here started, we were actually working on a whole different concept. Uh, it was the concept of providing coupons to shoppers in malls uh, whenever you enter to a store. Uh, after working with it for about a year with a, a good friend of mine, Gil is, a, is my co-founder, my, my, our talented CDO. After working with it with him about it for a year, we realized that we're working amazing, amazingly together. Uh, we also realized that we have a very cool technology in hand. We can elaborate about it later, if you will. But we were missing the, uh, the vision or we we're missing uh, a purpose behind this uh, whole mission around the startup. Uh, we thought, okay, providing people some discounts and stores is cool, but it's not necessarily going to wake up uh, at night or in the morning with a lot of motivation. And then we yeah. thought, okay, what else can we do together as a team uh, and around this technology? We run a little hackathon. And one of the ideas that we come up with was, hey, maybe instead of showing a coupon to a shopper when he's entered to the store, we'll just let him know what store it is. And if it happened to be uh, with orientation challenges, especially if he's blind or, or visually impaired, that could be very impactful, very meaningful. So we went to meet a few uh, people who are blind or visually impaired. I remember Tali specifically. Hopefully she's listening to that. Tali uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, blind from the age of two. And when we demonstrated to her a very lean prototype of it, you could literally hear her, you know, her chains. You, know, you can really hear the, the excitement out of her. Like, oh, my God, this can totally change my life. That's what, and I that was like, okay, this is mm. exactly the type of reactions we're looking to, to have. Uh, we started to, to offer it to different facilities and already started to generate some revenue. Uh, and yeah, I think our story, you know, from, from a uh, firsthand exper experience, I would say, you know, is my goal that eventually it will solve my own itch of getting lost wherever I go. Uh, I have lack of orientation wherever I go. Uh, and also, I think what's what's one of I think interesting parts of our story is that we've been able to run this business fully bootstrap uh, for over four years. Um, 
generating again uh, revenues over 200 uh, paying customers that's over 2000 locations as you mentioned um wow. and maybe i'll just share a little bit of what we're doing yeah i would love yeah. to hear so so tell us a little bit so the technology yeah. is basically you're turning signs into speak speaking signs so the signs right. speak to you or like maybe explain yeah. a little bit about the yeah. technology Sure. So we, we the, the question we come up with at the beginning or through this hackathon I mentioned is what if science could speak, right? There are signs everywhere. Uh, yeah, I'll show you two facts, really mind-blowing ones. That one, specifically in the U.S., there are over 100 million Braille signs. And wherever you go, you'll usually find them in elevators or in uh, restrooms or entrances. You'll find a, a sign Braille. The other fact is that over 90% Nine zero percent out of the blind and visually impaired community cannot read Braille at all. Ninety nine zero. Ninety. Yeah. If you happen to meet a blind person tomorrow, Simon, right. most chances that he cannot read Braille. And by the way, the ten percent who can don't know where the signs are to be able to touch them and therefore reading them. Right. Right. Yeah. And by the way, those who are lucky to find them not necessarily want to touch them because of COVID or because of other reasons. All in sure, all, there's yeah. just no effective. No effective way for for a lot of people. We're talking about millions of people around the world to go independently, uh, and our technology basically uh, is is like talking signs, just as you said. It's basically replaced smart beacons technology at the facility. We developed an app. Uh, it's a whole system with the cloud, but our app basically allows our users to hear audio descriptions of the world around them. Uh, right. For those listeners who kind of ask themselves right now, how would a blind person even use his smartphone? So guess what they do? And you can look at Google how they exactly do that. They're not just using smartphone. I will mention Adi, who is one of our developers who's also happened to be blind from birth. So they also code the app, uh, the different wow. app. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get into that later on, but sure. that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So, 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 how does it work? So, if I if if a blind person is walking by a sign, let's say at McDonald's, because McDonald's uh, is is one of your customers, they walk into a McDonald's. Tell us about some of the use cases. What happens? How do they yeah. use it? Yeah. Right. So the user's experience actually starts at home. Their user is downloading the app for free, uh, whether it's Android or iPhone. We support 26 different languages. And in the app, they can find the nearby locations around them uh, that are accessible with our system. So for example, all of McDonald's and all of Pizza Hut in Israel are accessible with it already. Uh, and then they can hear or learn, basically simulate the location at home so they can build a mental map of the environment even before arriving there. Uh, then the app going to ask them how would you like to reach their that's a restaurant, for instance. It fits through Uber, Lyft, or just by walk with GPS. Right? We have a whole GPS navigation experience outdoors. And once actually arriving to the facility, uh, once our beacons are installed there, our, our users getting an automated notification through their smartphone and starts actually speaking to them. So, for example, you are at the main oh, entrance. So they, that means they have to be connected to some kind of hearing, like uh, like Bluetooth headset or yeah. something yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, well yeah. some of our users using it just directly through the device there's a smartphone and others are using headphones whether if it's a bone conjunction or a bluetooth uh, type of headphones it doesn't really matter um and it just starts speaking to them in their own language in their own pace by the way some of them would like it faster some of them want it to be a bit slower again it's not mm -hmm. just for people who are blind or visually impaired there's also people with different cognitive uh, disabilities or even mental that's using it. Uh, and it's basically telling them, hey, welcome to McDonald's. Uh, you are at the main entrance. Uh, the open hours are Monday to Friday. And then also, no matter where the user is pointing with his smartphone, 360 degrees around him, it also lets him know what is there in what distance. So for example, the counter is in this direction for, I don't know, 20 feet. The restrooms mm -hmm. is in a different direction for whatever, 30 feet. Uh, all in all, it's all about providing our users uh, an independent experience, uh, an equal experience. Uh, and I think what's fulfilled us more than anything else, more than the revenues we are generating, more than anything else, is really the, the feedback that we're receiving from users is actually claiming that they're not leaving their house without it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Um, well, if, for people that want to learn more, they can definitely dive into it. But... I'm very interested in the growth story. 
You guys sure. mentioned uh, Bootstrap for the first four years and grew it to over 2,000 locations, actually revenue generating clients such as McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Costa Coffee. I don't know if I'm missing. Uh, yeah, Microsoft. I missing yeah. Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of cust- uh, a lot of clients. How how did this happen? What was the what was the 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 marketing challenge that you guys were able to solve? Like how were you guys able to acquire all these customers? Yeah. Um I think I think at the beginning we we uh, we were very afraid that you know we need to have a lot of users to like a chicken and egg type of problem. We need to have a lot of users to be able to work with the facilities, and and we were surprised at the beginning to realize that you know when you do something good, really good, like something good for society, for people, for the sake of doing good, right? Businesses and people in general are happy to you know to work together with you and really help you. You know, for every mm-hmm. entrepreneur is listening to us, you know, people, when you talk about your new business, people are happy to help you out. And, it's, and that goes like five times more when you do this, if this business has, a, I would say, a, a higher purpose than the business itself. So I think, uh, you know, that's how we started with, with the first and two, three, you know, locations that we've turned accessible. We also have been surprised to see that a lot of the marketing we're generating has been done through them because they were talking about the fact that they're now accessible. Right. Wow. Uh, they were making the videos. They were promoting these videos on YouTube and other channels that they are now accessible. It's on their brand benefit, but it generated a lot of leads to us. So it's kind of mm. built a whole uh, uh, marketing growth engine within the, the business model, if you will. Every new client that work with us also talk loudly about it, and that's provide us more clients on board. And another, another, I would say, channel that helped us a lot is our users. Again, when when a user have a good experience uh, in, in an accessible store, he's talking about it and he's a- started to request it and even demand it from other other business owners. Um, so we, I think we were very, very lucky to be able to grow uh, organically so quickly. Um, and also, I would say, solve a, a different challenge with assistive technology in general. Usually, talking about assistive technology, it's, it's a small amount of people uh, who use yeah. that. With our business model, our business model is not relying on the amount of people with disabilities, but the amount of facilities, buildings, and a bunch of them out there. Exactly. Wow. So, two thousand locations. Is that uh, mostly in uh, like what what con- what countries are you guys in right now? Right. We, we've been mostly in Israel in the past uh, five years. Most of our activity is still in Israel. Uh, but we do have over 100 locations in France. Uh, we have in other parts of Europe, we have a little bit in Dubai. And most of our focus, uh, especially in the past uh, year, is now here in North America. We have a little bit of locations right. in, uh, in Toronto already in Canada. We have uh, a little bit more here in the U.S. I'm currently in uh, Maryland. Uh, okay. This is where our office is uh, is now set up, and uh, we're just in the beginning here. Cool. So, so it sounds sounds like your clients and your users basically the challenge in the beginning was getting your first couple of clients and getting your first couple of users. But once you got them, they almost became your your cheerleaders and your your own marketing department, right? Absolutely. So. Tell us about your first couple of uh, um, clients and first couple of users. Where did you get these users and where did you get these clients? Was it just, I guess, I'm just guessing like uh, with these clients, you maybe you you talk to their their team or, you know. Yeah, we were managers. at the very, very beginning, early stage. It was just the lowest hanging fruits we could, you know, put our hands on. So for in terms of users, we were just reaching out to the municipality and ask, hey, you know, can you help us with the social services? Can you help us get in front of people with that type of challenges, especially people who are blind and visually impaired? So we want to test it out. And there was very receptive. This is how we get to our users. In terms of clients, you know, the first one actually was the very, you know, the, the universe, university I was studied at. So I was like, hey, I've oh. studied there. I, I know someone there. It's a university. They, they also have to be accessible. Let's stuck to them. Uh, we didn't even have a product finalized at a time, to be honest. Oh, uh, wow. We have mostly an idea and something very, uh, very, very lean. Uh, but based on their feedback, we, and, and eventually the deal will close with them, it's allowed us to actually develop it, and 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 once, by the way, this university done it, then we now we have a reference, right? We have a reference. Mm. We can go with this reference to a new 
university or even a shopping mall. And it's, uh, it was almost like a, a, a snowball effect. Yeah. Uh, I think, again, a big part of it is the impact we're making. Uh, people, especially nowadays, are, are, uh, are, are, are passionate about making an impact, a social impact. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, uh, a really great asset uh, from a business perspective. If your business is making an impact, that's a huge business advantage. Yeah, when I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, I think one common trait is that the, uh, the companies that were successful, they didn't necessarily start marketing once the whole thing was built out. You know, you got the product, you got the, you know, you got the final, like, you always talk about the MVP, right? The minimal viable product. Go to market with that. Or in your case, you didn't even have a product and you start you started approaching the end users. Get some feedback and maybe they will help drive your decisions when you're actually building the product, right? Absolutely. And I, I will I will always claim, and when I talk with different fellow entrepreneurs, that the minimal, usually the minimal viable product that you have in mind is way more that you need to have. Like literally, mm. it's way, way more. You need to cut it a lot. If if you have, I be, I personally believe that at least for mobile web type of businesses, software businesses, apps, uh, a landing page that would be your maximum. Uh, there, don't go any any further than that, because the landing page or an email sometimes will go just get you through the the messaging, the value proposition, yeah. and if there is an interest, a real interest. Okay, now you have uh, now you have the work to to actually develop it and deliver. But you want to make sure that there is a demand for that first. So when you first approached your first couple of clients, did you have a website? Like wh- wh- yeah, what? We had, website. Like, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we had a website. Yeah, we had a website. That by the way, this was a you know type of a Wix basic uh, website. Uh, it was a you know very very. Uh, um, I, I think that in the early stage, you have to a little bit fake it until you make it. So we had to build mm-hmm. a website, create a business card at the time, you know, something like you look professional because this type of organization, especially if you're dealing with B2B or B, you know, 2 e type of uh, big corporates, they want to know that it's legit. But uh, technology-wise, we didn't have... And by the way, I'm so glad because we got a lot of questions during these meetings. Like, hey, do you have it in multiple languages? And we're like, Mm. Didn't even talk Ooh, about it. Good like, idea, right? And then, and like, now you're gonna add, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and does it like? Can you color it so it won't uh, interfere with the aesthetics of the wall? Sure, yeah, sure. How do we like? We need to find how, how, how. But yeah, sure. So it's like, you, you, and this type of, of feedback is invaluable. We could never knew that without talking to them. So, getting wow. outside of the building is is important. Yeah, and then you got so then you got your first client. Um, did you guys ever use any, uh, traditional marketing, uh, pa- channels like SEO, PPC, influencers, affiliates, anything like that to grow We're, or was it very organic? Well, in the past year, we started to do that a little bit, a little bit, just in the past year, you know, we, we know much better about our business. Now we do have a product now we have, you know, we, we want to scale it up. So yeah, we, in the past year, we've started to use this type of, of, uh, uh, traditional marketing, um, but I think I think that even today, our, and I think for forever, our main uh, dominant marketing engine would be our network, would be the 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 community we're building around businesses and around users. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's a so big is it, asset. So is it mostly is it mostly like a sales team then, like a kind of a sales, a customer service team that's doing a lot of outreach, like kind of BD, like a business development team. And we, that's we have only one growing. right now, Nikki. Hopefully, she's hearing us as well. Uh, we have only one right now. Uh, we're ex- planning to extend that again here in the U.S. Uh, we are still early on. We're still like mm-hmm. understanding and making the adjustment to the U.S. market. Very different than the, the Israeli one, uh, yeah. but a lot more regulations. Or sorry, a lot more regulations. A little bit tougher to break in, or uh, a very different regulations. A very different, different regulations. Uh, not sure if yeah. more or less, but very different. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a different, it's just a different market, different uh, tactics, different, you know, a, lo- a lot of differences. But uh, we're making great progress. Uh, I'm here almost a year now in the U.S. 
and I'm very proud of it. We're looking backward of what we've been able to accomplish in the past year. Yeah. And then in terms of the clients, I know, um, uh, or, or the customer side, when you guys first grew, you guys went directly to the municipalities. Is it as easy in the U.S. to do that? Or is there a different, uh, or, or you have taken a different approach in the U.S. and Canada? Well, I think in Israel, it's much easier, to be honest. Uh, I think um, there is a reason why Israel is kind of startup nation type of country, because it's very, very small. Uh, there are good chances that you'll find someone who knows someone at certain you know, companies or, or organizations. So it would make it much, much easier. Here, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say it's too difficult because uh, a lot of people are not doing it. Uh, but it's, I guess, just because we're new here, it's a bit more difficult than it was in, in Israel. But uh, again, I think in our case, the fact that we're doing good uh, mm -hmm. is really, really helping us from two reasons. One is from the outreach itself, the act of outreaching itself, because you truly believe in what you're trying to accomplish. And that's just, it's not sure. just closing another deal. It's uh -huh. turning another place accessible. And secondly, the other side is more receptive to this. And, uh, and maybe I'll add another note about it. You know, COVID in the past two years hit the world and uh, two, two and a half. And that was challenging times. It's also starting at challenging times right now with the inflation and, you know, whatever going on in the economics. The mm -hmm. fact that we're reminding ourselves that we're really, what we're doing here is bigger than the business. It's really bigger than the business. Really Absolutely. helped to build the tenacity within the team. It helps to build the tenacity. It helps to build, to build the, the confidence and the belief in what we're doing. So that's a great force, as I said before. Amazing. Well, um, I'd like to close off just by uh, just kind of hearing a little bit about what right here is up to. Like, what should we look forward to in the next six to 12 months? Like, what's the big what's the big milestone? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> we're about to launch something new uh, very soon and uh, probably next month, uh, mostly focusing on small businesses. Uh, we are looking to them. So as I said before, we are working with different enterprise levels from governmental to, to private sector, uh, across different sectors. We want to reach and be able to turn also the small businesses accessible. Uh, so we're about to launch uh, uh, something around that soon. Uh, our team is growing. So uh, if everyone listening to us uh, here in the US or specifically in the Maryland area, feel free to go to our website, check our jobs, uh, or just contact me directly if you're passionate about what we're doing. We're different positions open soon. Um. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll we'll definitely have your website on the show notes for anyone listening that are, that are interested, and also uh, your name uh, will be also uh, visible somewhere. So definitely uh, uh, in, invite uh, Idan to uh, to connect on LinkedIn. He says he's, he's yeah. uh, like he said he's very accessible. So, uh, sure. well, thank you so much for jumping on and talking about marketing with us. Uh, Absolutely. thank you. You're, you know, one of the earlier episodes. So we're gonna try to keep growing this, and uh, hopefully, to have you back soon and hear some uh -huh. more success stories. Amen to that. And you're on the right track. So thank you so much, Simon. Thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs>